Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery, yes. and this will be part 2, 99 in our series. <coughs> the topic is the Seed of the Serpent. We're continuing in part 5. <coughs> Scripture teaches Satan will use tares in an organized program to overthrow a government to enslave God's people. We're going to look at a recounting in the scripture of how Satan moves to overthrow a government, render it totally opposed to God's people with the ultimate goal of uh, putting God's people in bondage and ultimate destruction. Turn to Exodus, excuse me, turn to Isaiah. Isaiah 52, verse 4. For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now the only Bible translation I believe you're going to see this interpretation is the King James. Because the, the, the terminology Assyrian is another term for Satan. The NIV does not translate this as the Assyrian. It translates it as Assyria, which gives the understanding. He's talking about the nation, the people of ancient Assyria. It is not what the scripture is talking about. There were no Assyrians in Egypt at this time. He's talking about Satan embarked on a plan to overthrow the government, the controlling authority of Egypt to put the Israelites into bondage. Turn to Exodus, the first chapter. We're going to start in verse 7 to 8. In the background, Egypt has been <coughs> flourishing. It's been so good that uh, the entire nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, are settled in a region called Goshen. They're flourishing. The people are flourishing as a result of the work of Joseph, who stored up tremendous wealth for the nation and fed them at a time. As a matter of fact, not only Egypt did he feed, he fed the other nations around her at a time of famine, tremendous egregious famine, was ravishing <coughs> that uh, part of the world. So the, the Egyptian rulers favored the Israelites with this wealthy land uh, called Goshen. They were left to uh, thrive and to endure and to grow and it was peaceful, pleasant place to live. Now we're going to pick it up in Exodus, the first chapter, starting in verse 7 and 8. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt which knew not Joseph. Prior to this time Joseph was like a founding father. 
he was revered by the Egyptians, the government, and everything else because they understood how he had blessed the nation for a generation to come. Now, in this case, when it talks about a new king who knew not Joseph, the word knew there comes from a term, Hebrew term, yada, which means, among other things, recognize. So what happened was, when this king ascended to authority, he would not allow Joseph and Joseph's doings to be recognized. More so on the op opposition, anything now dealing with the Israelites was going to be denigrated. They were going to be taken not from a positive perspective, they're going to be misused, misconstrued to make this people look like not an asset, but a threat. Drop down to verses 9 to 10. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. <clears throat> so what he's doing is this, he's a tear and he's being given the charisma to influence the nation and turn the nation against the, the Hebrew people <coughs> in the land of Goshen. All before this point they've been looked upon favorably as an asset to the country. He takes that and he, and he totally reverses it to make them look like a threat to the people. He puts a spirit of fear upon the people as it relates to the Israelites. And he becomes successful at this because it's Satan behind him initiating his plan to bring these people into egregious captivity. Drop down to verse 11. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities Pitham and Ramses. So basically this enters into a time where the people go into slavery. Egregious mistreatment at the hands of the Egyptians. For 400 years this kept on. Now, this brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches under Satan's influence, the Israelites lost their identity and accepted the lowly status inflicted upon them and his programming which kept them in bondage to tear leadership. In other words, after 400 years of this programming, even the time that Israel was released they may have been released from physical bondage, but the programming was still within them. Numbers, 11th chapter, verse 4 to 6. They are now released from Egypt out of the house of bondage. They're going now toward the promised land, but their mind is still in Egypt. Verse 4. The mixed multitude, this is non-Israelites that came out of slavery with the Israelites. The mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely. 
the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. This is in the midst of the time when manna is falling out of heaven and uh, basically <clears throat> they're eating angel's food but they're miserable. They're complaining about the leeks and the fish that they had in, in Egypt forgetting conveniently 400 years of abject slavery and bondage. It's a Luciferian influence. You can't underestimate, I can't beat this drum enough. The human race is in bondage, not physically, but spiritually, to the Luciferian influence. Yes? Why was it determined 40 years they would wander? 400 years? 40. 40? It's a generation. Uh, YHVH said, this generation that's murmured against me is not going to make it into the promised land. The new generation will. Because the new generation learned to keep its mouth shut and not complain. They were allowed to go into the promised land. Cold. <clears throat> Let's go on. Turn to... <clears throat> This is a book you're going to find difficult. You're going to find it uh, somewhat difficult to find. Nehemiah, it's after Second Chronicles, which is after Kings. Second Chronicles, then you come to Ezra, then you come to Nehemiah. When you get to Nehemiah, we want chapter 9, we're going to read verses 13 to 17. Nehemiah Chronicles the visitations of YHVH to his people. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. This took, took place after they came out of Egypt. And made it known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and command, commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws by the hand of Moses thy servant. He gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought us forth water for them out of the rock for their thirst and, and promised them that they should go in to possess the land which thou hast sworn to give them. But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments, and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks, and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Now this remind you of something? Last night's lesson. Tares refuse the salvation of Christ. Why? Because of Luciferian programming. Israelites did the same thing. Why? Because of Luciferian programming. Their minds never left Egypt, although their bodies did. Their bodies made it to the promised land. Their minds never did. You cannot underestimate Luciferian influence. Should we consider that Y3H in his cutting off of that one generation was also punishing the tares who caused that to be the case in the first place. Oh, they had already been punished. But then the tares are still going to incarnate into later generations anyway, so sure. you can't get rid of them. Sure. That's the idea. Yeah. The idea is not to get rid of them. The idea is to get his people to see it for what it is. Right. Which they refuse to do. Which brings to the next principle. It's the same thing with Christians. 
Scripture teaches the mindset of the Israelites was the result of 400 years of Luciferian <coughs> and Luciferian gods influence. Turn to Exodus 32 <coughs> verse 1. Exodus 32 verse 1. Not only were the tares arrayed against them, which led them into bondage, but it was the worship of gods that kept them in bondage. Mm -hmm. And when the people saw <coughs> That Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron didn't do too much protesting. Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in your ears, the ears of your wives and your sons, and of your daughters and bring them unto me. They couldn't wait to go back into bondage. Now they saw the miracles of wife's VH did, ten miracles that wiped out Egypt. He saw the miracles that they were doing in the desert, coming across the manor and everything. All of this meant absolutely nothing. Why? Because the Luciferian program was not broken. Yes. Okay. The way I read this looks like it was Aaron's idea to build the calf and worship it. Well, Aaron was acceding to them, uh, their understanding. They said, make us gods. So he knew what gods would please them. <clears throat> the gods they'd been worshiping in Egypt, which was one who was a calf god. There were other gods also. But he felt this would be the best one to bring curry favor for the Egyptians when they came back into the land. What is this telling us? This is telling us that the human mind is so wretched and so corrupted that God can't deal with it. That's why no Old Testament saint will make heaven. You have to be born again. Mm -hmm. What they had, their faith, saved them. But they were not capable of ascending beyond the earth environment. So for eternity, they're going to be on the earth. And the promises basically dealt with the earth. And then the one promise that dealt with life in heaven for them. Sure. <coughs> you also see that comfort seems to keep their minds off the law and on their gods. And it's exactly the same as it is sure. with Christians today. Sure. Everything is earth-centered. Mm. Everything has to do with the senses. They will not develop the spiritual nature they're going to gravitate toward placating the carnal nature. <clears throat> Exodus 20th chapter, verse 3 to 5. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of any that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. They've been doing this for 400 years. <coughs> worshiping the gods. It was so ingrained in them. Didn't know anything else. Even though the patriarchs came out of Canaan with them uh, I, uh, uh, Jacob lived in Israel. He died in Egypt. They brought him back to Canaan. 
So he had passed on to them the promises. He passed on to them the law that uh, Abraham had passed down to him, that the promises were contained in. Yet and still, they never embraced it. Under the Luciferian influence, they embraced the worship of the gods. Under, under the Luciferian influence, they gravitated toward the egregious bondage of the terror government of Egypt. Their minds were so programmed by the Luciferian influence that they could, would not release to go back to their own heritage. Turn to uh, Exodus 12th chapter. We see the, 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 the lengths to which YHVH went to eradicate this. Exodus 12, verse 12. <clears throat> For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So he's, going to, so he's saying to them, I'm going to show you where your gods are coming from. I'm going to wipe them out, and I'm going to imprison them in the heart of the earth. After I take care of the house of Pharaoh and all the ruling elites of Egypt, he's doing. why is he doing this? To show his people his power. And after the dust settles, they, they come out of Egypt with the wealth of Egypt. And the Egyptians, cringing out of fear, wanted to get them out of there as soon as possible. But it did not affect them. It didn't break the programming of the mental state that they were in. They couldn't release it to receive the liberation and understand what had happened to them. That they were free. But they didn't feel they were free. They murmured and carped and grabbed and complained all across the way <clears throat> because of the influence they were under. So should we understand that at the beginning of sorrows when we see the Adamic memory being erased when that kicks in. This is a similar situation. Exactly. That for the for the for the father to give to those coming out of the Adamic order, what it is, uh, uh, let me use the term, their birthright, if you wish. They have to let go of what they had before. Definitely. Even, you don't know, wait till then. Yeah. We're supposed to let go of the human when you get born again. Mm -hmm. Because if you hold on to it, you hold on to Luciferian programming. So Luciferian programming then reestablishes the human at the point of being, I mean, that's the counteraction at the point of being uh, born again. Certainly. And it takes a person into retrograde motion. Mm -hmm. You cannot progress in Christ. You cannot progress in the knowledge of the things of Christ because you're programmed to focus and identify with the things of the Luciferian, uh, 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 the pseudo-Luciferian system. This is the problem with the Israelites. It's the problem with the church today. Same problem. Yes. So if Adam wouldn't have fallen, would he have become a spiritual leader? Sure. Okay. The human race would have dominated the earth. The whole educational system, Mr. Jones, I mean, from, from day one to, to now, nothing's ever been taught correctly. It's all distortions and facsimiles thereof. Exactly. It's, it's just nothing exactly. is... Exactly. The truth has never been spoken. This Bible has never been taught. Certain parts of it have been given to people from a human perspective. The Bible, as it was originally designed to be understood, has never been understood. If it were understood, there'd be more than three of us in this room tonight. Mm. The seminaries do not teach the true Christian faith. The um, churches don't preach true Christian faith. That's why the prototokias have been authorized to do what they are going to do. They're going to be the first group to bring truth to the earth. Praise the Lord. Amen. And the creation. Amen. Let's go on. 
Scripture teaches, although the Israelites were finally freed from the Egyptian tares, they did not fight the influence of the tares who came from their own nation. In other words, they, they were released from the Egyptian tares, but the Israelite tares put them in a greater bondage than the Egyptian tares did. Example, turn to Isaiah, the third chapter, verses 12 to 15. Isaiah, the third chapter, verses 12 to 15. The religious leaders of Israel put them in a greater bondage than they had experienced in the gods of Egypt's time. Verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people, <coughs> the tares, and the princes thereof, <coughs> the tares that are ruling. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces, and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. Well, you see what's happening here, the tares, once Israel was established as a nation, their influence came in and just ate them all. They didn't fight. They just yielded just like the Christians today, just like the American citizens today, are yielding to the tares that are running this government and egregiously changing the laws, egregiously putting people back into bondage, and there's no outcry, there's no people just submit to the point where just the same thing in Nazi Germany, the same thing in China, Satan doesn't change his method of operation because it's always successful. Only ones that are going to fight this are going to be the prototokis. You can bet when this thing falls, uh, the enemy, Satan, is going to taste some power he didn't taste, taste before I mean, under I mean, the against. sons of God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Jesus had some words for the tares of his time. Turn to Matthew 23. We're going to read verses 1 to 15. This spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. What was supposed to take place under YHVH when he established the Mosaic Society was to give them the law so that they could effectively live the life that was designed for them to live that they could flourish, that they could be blessed, and they become a mighty nation. That was all blunted when Satan went in there and festooned it with his tares and erected a priest society of tares, a society of kings who were tares, and put the people in an egregious bondage. Yes? Okay, back in Noah's day, 
when he could look on the face of the baby and tell if one was son of God or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, with that knowledge, he did nothing except for plant a garden or plant a vineyard. Um, why, why wasn't there some sort of a, a plan put together, an indoctrination plan? I mean, you know, only several people or eight people, but I'm trying to understand. I mean, it's been let go for so many thousands of years, Mr. Jones, and we're just now starting to reveal the truth. And why did it take so long for the truth to be given to given to us? Because the truth for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years has been rejected. The human race rejects truth. That's why Noah uh, 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 planted a vineyard. You don't think he didn't do anything? Where he's preached for 120 years, judgment that was going to come. He found that what was happening here was that the ter influence was becoming so great that it would overwhelm the human race unless something was done. Well, nothing was done. You saw what his son did to him. The disrespect. You saw the blessing that he gave his other two sons who were trying to do something about it. But the people that were involved did absolutely nothing. Just like the people that were involved in Adam's time who knew the story of the garden, who knew the serpent was no friend, yielded to it anyway. I'm telling you, I keep beating this drum. The human race yields to the Luciferian influence. You can tell Christians this story. You think they're going to do something about it? I, I'm reminded of a story I maybe told you guys before, but I'm going to tell it again. When I was in grade school, the teacher did a study. They did a test. Mm -hmm. The teacher whispered something in one guy's ears, and he was supposed to turn around to the guy behind him, and at the end of the you know the classroom, we wanted to hear the the story that the teacher had taught told him and what they ended up getting, and it was just it, it was night and day. Distortion, it was, yeah. yeah. So it was it was a test showing you, man cannot remember anything unless you write it down and you make covenants and all. That. Will not remember. Won't put through the effort. Turn to Jude. Verse 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you that and exhort you, this is the church he's talking to, that you should earnestly contend, earnestly contend, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. They will not fight. Turn to Acts, 20th chapter. Starting verse 26. <clears throat> Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, take heed, take heed, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. Now, was that mandate carried forth? No. Was Jude's plea carried forth? No. The human race will not fight. I rest my case. 
They were warned. People tried to do something. We've been doing this for 30 years. The human race makes its own bed to lie in because basically it refuses to fight. Simple as that. Christians have the tools to remain free. Matter of fact, turn to Galatians, the fifth chapter. We see plea after plea for something to be done. Galatians, the fifth chapter. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore. Stand fast, therefore. In other words, fight in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. They've been warned time after time after time after time. What do they do? Do they respond? No. So what is the result? The result is what you have here. Human race... It's composed uh, from Adam on down of individuals that for some reason will shirk its responsibility, will shirk its potential to develop, will not acquiesce to its calling. That's why it's forfeiting its prime place as a dominant race on the surface of the earth. They're going to basically become a race of vassals for the duration after the beginning of the beginning of sorrows. Look for the prototokias. They are the ones that are going to take up the battle. They're the ones that are going to go forth. They're the ones that are going to not only dominate this world, they're going to dominate the whole creation. Why you said? Because God said it. I didn't. He did. Been received, but what has not been received. And we are programmed to look at not what we have, but what we don't have. But when we steal ourselves and set ourselves in motion to look at ourselves as not not having, but having in abundance. I believe it sets in motion things to come into our life, into our existence. That makes sense. Because we put ourselves in a receivable position. A person who doesn't have asks to receive. Okay. A person who has gives thanks for what they already have. And that puts in motion more things to come into the life. I believe it delights the Father when we have that mindset. So you could go as far as to say that this increasing lack, and I'm using that word advisedly, that mm -hmm. uh, the Adamic reality is experiencing mm -hmm. is purely to re-engender uh, the belief that there is such a thing as supply and demand. That there is sure. such a thing as not over here but over here. Sure. We live in a, a reality that exists to limit those that inhabit this reality. And the limitations stand basically on things that are not available. Mm. That's why people are rich in comparison, comparison to people that are poor. They have what the poor don't have. Right. And this whole thing, the mechanism runs off of lack. I have something, you need something, I have power over you because I have what you want and I can put out uh, a, a methodology to control you so that you are made to do this to receive what I have. The whole thing runs off of that. Sure. When we look at ourselves as having all... Paul, sitting in a jail cell, said I have all things. Hmm. 
But Paul made a point. He says, I don't look at myself as being a possessor of anything. I look at myself as being a steward of all things. God puts it into my hand to use for the time that they're needed, but I don't hold on to them. I just thank Him for the time that He's given me where I have access to them, and I gladly relinquish them because I don't need them anymore. That's the idea of the saint. We're just passing through this place. I don't want to have the comprehension of a fullness of having a need for this, having a need for that. It takes me off of my delighting in the Lord, who He is. I know that I reach a point where I know He's going to supply my need, so I don't have to depend upon worrying about having something I don't have. I know if I need it, I'm going to have it. And I believe that pleases the, the Lord, and He m moves in the direction where I do have it. So begin to thank Him for what you have already perceived, having received, even though you may not have it physically. And you're going to have it in a much shorter period of time. Amen.